thank you very much, uh, uh, Danny. Um, let me also begin by uh, greeting, um, I almost said, uh, the honorable, uh, the veteran, uh, Dr. Brigalia Bum. Uh, it's indeed a very special privilege to host you as well here. And of course, leaders and executives in the um, Desmond Tutu Diversity Trust, it's a very special privilege also to welcome you uh, this morning <coughs> here at the University of Johannesburg's Bunting Road, or Auckland Park Bunting Road campus, one of four campuses of the University of Johannesburg, um, four campuses hosting some 48,500 uh, students. Uh, our campuses also host another eight or 9,000 students who undertake uh, non-degree programs. Um, typically, they join us in the evenings. And so our campuses are typically busy until 10 p.m. Uh, in, in the evening as we, as we make our important contribution to nurturing uh, the country's uh, highly skilled um, persons. And of course, uh, we also do so beyond our borders. <coughs> with some 3,000 international students also registered here at the university. And so it's a very special privilege then uh, for me to extend a very warm welcome and in particular to express our most sincere appreciation, uh, Danny, to you and your colleagues for um, having um, requested us um, to, what is almost said the word, to co-chair uh, this, uh, this very important a national conversation. Uh, and so I extend then a very warm welcome. Now, the program says uh, welcome and, and something else for 30 minutes, right? So uh, I thought I'm going to have to fill up my 30 minutes, right? <laughs> and so I, I begin by um, uh, again expressing um, our full support for the work that the Trust. Um, uh, is initiating in respect of, of this theme, how far have we come and how far do we need to go. It is a matter that uh, continues to be the focal point for us here at this university and uh, having uh, briefly spoken yesterday um, at the uh, National Forum of Universities, uh, where the Transformation and Diversity Officers met also at the University of Johannesburg at uh, the Auckland Park Kingsway campus. Um, I can assure you um, and colleagues and friends here today that the matter of diversity transformation occupies a central place uh, in the work um, of our university system. I do though want to begin by, by saying that, or by observing that the democratic breakthrough that dawned on us in 1994 demonstrated the extraordinary capability of South Africans, not only to embrace challenge and to rise up, but also, I think, as you have pointed out, uh, uh, Dr. Titus, um, our, our quest, our resolve, notwithstanding our histories, our quest, our resolve to nurture, as you reminded us, unity in diversity. And so, as we sit midpoint between 1994 and 2030, and 2030 simply being the marker uh, that I use as a reference in respect of the National Development Plan, it is apt for us to, to have a substantive national conversation about how far we have come and how far we need to go. I share with you a somewhat lengthy extract from the 
National Development Plan Vision 2030. And I should say, in passing, that the National Planning Commission, uh, of which uh, I'm a commissioner, um, commissioned, interesting use of three commission words there in one sentence, commissioned um, uh, Professor Njabulun Debele, who is Chancellor of the University of Johannesburg, and Anki Kroch, together with the Planning Commission to explore a picture of 2030. And I thought that this might be helpful as we, as we gather ourselves, as we collect our thoughts, um, and as we, we press on with the work program of today. And it goes, this particular extract goes as follows. We, the people of South Africa, have journeyed far since the long lines of our first democratic election on 27 April 1994, when we elected a government for all of us. Now, in 2030, we live in a country which we have remade. Therefore, in 2030, we experience daily how we participate fully in efforts to liberate ourselves from conditions that hinder the flowering of our talents. We all see to it and assist so that all life's enablers are available in a humane way. We all have actively set out to change our lives in, way, in ways which also benefit the broader community. We all assist the institutions we have creatively redesigned to meet our varied needs. We reach out across communities to strengthen our resolve to live with honesty, to be set against corruption, and against dehumanizing actions. We know that those to whom we have given the privilege to govern our land do so on our behalf and for the benefit of our people. We say to one another, I cannot be without you. Without you, the South African community is an incomplete community. Without one single person, without one single group, without the region or the continent, we are not the best that we can be. We acknowledge that each and every one of us is intimately and inextricably of this earth with its beauty and life-giving sources, that our lives on earth are both enriched and complicated by what we have contributed to its condition. South Africa belongs to all its peoples. Now, in 2030, our story keeps growing as if spring is always with us. Once we uttered the dream of a rainbow, now we see it, living it. It does not curve over the sky. It is refracted in each one of us at home, in the community, in the city, and across the land in an abundance of color. When we see it in the faces of our children, we know there will always be for us a worthy future. So I share that ex extract with you in the hope that it will also challenge us as we examine how far we have traveled, but it challenges us about where our desired future should be as well. And so the National Development Plan anticipates, therefore, within this vision, a prosperous, a more equal society with full employment underpinned by a skilled workforce and world-class systems, including its education system. So, migrating over the next 15 to 20 years to this kind of society must challenge us at our core. 
It, can't, it cannot be a journey that is based on journeys of the past. As important as those journeys are to strengthen resolve, as important as those journeys are to improve courage and confidence, it's got to be made day in, day out. And it must challenge us at our core. For if it doesn't challenge us at home, in our community organizations and institutions, at work, in broader society. If it doesn't challenge us to our core, then I'm afraid we are not engaged in a substantive and a deep conversation about, about giving life and meaning to the democratic breakthrough that became possible in 1994. I turn in particular very briefly my attention to the university sector. I do so because often, often, transformation and diversity is constructed as a zero-sum game. Often, it is global excellence and stature that's pinned or that's presented as in competition with transformation and diversity. I say this because if one examines the facts on the ground in the university system, then we must be very, very concerned. The fact that only 38% of academics are black must be of concern. The fact that we have a situation where some of our institutions only have 5% black African academics in that institution must be of concern. Because if this future, if this vision, that this extract that I've shared with you, if that vision is to be realized, if that vision is to become within reach, then our higher education institutions, of course, like other important, very important institutions at the apex of our society, then those institutions, this institution, our peer institutions, surely, surely require new thinking, new reflection. Precisely this question, how far have we come and how far do we need to go? I should, of course, have made the point that the 38% black academics are concentrated in our historically black institutions. And so the 38% average may look better than it actually is when one examines the facts on the ground. We know that very few of our black and women academics are in senior positions whether as professors or whether as heads of departments, whether as deans and vice deans, whether as the deputy vice chancellors and vice chancellors. And so this long shadow of Fervordian apartheid ideology continues to remain with us. And dare I say the long shadow of of Calvinism continues to be with us. Whether we look at the challenges that confront us from a black, from a woman, from a disability, from the full array, the full array of difference that our Bill of Rights challenges us to embrace. If one examines the, the situation somewhat further, then it is not only the visible. The visible is in the numbers, in the picture. The invisible is in the experience, in the encounter. The invisible is when I enter a dominant culture. The invisible, the challenging, the one that we need to engage with in conversation, in dialogue, and in transformation, 
is the invisible. And so as much as the visible requires its own remedies, its own medium to long-term plans, deliberate plans, equally the invisible requires its own um, attention as well. And so the dominant culture, the conversations, the prejudices, the role models. If this vision that we're speaking of, 2030, is to be realized, this idea that I cannot live without you, I cannot, we cannot live without each other in the society. I can be better when we live together. Then these are clearly the invisible dimensions of the visible that requires its own um, attention uh, uh, as well. I should say that the National Development Plan anticipates step change on a range of dimensions in the university sector. It has set a modest goal for 2030 of 50% of academics being black. Very modest goal. Demonstrating that, and, and I use the word step change to earlier in this particular instance because it's not step change. It is modest improvement in the period ahead. It's probably in the other area that it's calling for step change, and I'll just signal one of them. The fact that only 34% of academics of doctoral degrees surely must be a major limitation on our ambitions. It sets a target of 75% of all staff holding doctoral degrees by 2030. And I simply signal this as a teaser for you to have a look at the National Development Plan, its vision, and perhaps the chapters that are of particular uh, interest um, to you. And so, given this picture that we're confronted with, there must be those amongst us who are excited about making progress quickly. One of the issues that's uh, in focus at the moment, um, the Minister of Higher Education and Training has, uh, 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 end of last year, established a Transformation Oversight Committee. And the Transformation Oversight Committee has been given the implicit, explicit job of pushing, of building momentum in the system. Not encouraging or persuading, pushing, driving hard, uh, vice chancellors and councils um, to, to respond more robustly um, to the issue um, of um, transformation um, and, uh, uh, and diversity. I'm simply giving, I hope if, if there's one thing I can leave uh, the podium with today, it is the idea of the visible and the invisible. And the idea that we may tackle the visible, but the invisible turns out to be the more enduring, the more troubling dimension. Because when you go into that culture, into that particular experience, and that is untransformed. That is not in conversation. That is not in dialogue with itself and with other cultures and other ways of seeing and other ways of doing. Then the visible will have little effect. So if I could, if, if, if there's one, that one thing that I can leave behind, and therefore I challenge us in whatever we do. How far have we come? How far do we need to go? Let's challenge ourselves to examine both the visible and, and the invisible dimensions. Arising from this uh, transformation oversight process, an interesting um, uh, analysis that's doing the rounds in the university sector um, uh, is the so-called equity index of the university system that uh, is a mathematical model that has been developed by Professor 
Mahoba at UKZN with his colleague there, Professor Govender. And this equity index looks at the last five years. So where were you five years ago? Where are you today? In terms of a range of indicators, such as what's your student profile? Undergrad, postgrad. What's your student success rate? Undergrad, postgrad. Uh, using the, 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 the categories white, Indian, so-called colored, black, African. Um, the academic staff profile. The Senate profile. Senate is the, the body that, represent, that, that comprises of the most senior scholars in the university. So what do they look like? What's the picture? What was it then? What is it now? Um, the executive leadership profile. So your deanery, what was it then? What does it look like now? Your, your deputy vice chancellor, registrar, vice chancellor mix, what, is, what was it then? What does it look like now? And so on and so forth. Um, it seems to me that that is not enough though. I mean, that's the visible. It's important. I'm not denying that. I recognize it. I highlight it in my own work here at the University of Johannesburg. Um, we pursue very clear objectives in respect of those matters. But it seems to me we need to go to the SODIN ministerial review to get to some of the elements of the invisible in respect of the university sector, ranging from the institution's culture. What, what can we learn from the culture in the university? Does it embrace or is it resilient to diversity and transformation? Do the old cultures endure? Do the old cultures get into conversation? Are they transformed in the process? Curriculum reform is another particular issue um, uh, that, the, that the Sodin Commission, or committee in particular, draws attention to. And dare I add one other interesting dimension? That is the external collaboration between South African institutions. I should say that in the period since the end of apartheid, South Africa's research collaboration has tripled. tripled. So the number of collaborations between academics here in South Africa and our external peers, it's tripled. Yeah, the research output has doubled in the same period. But the more interesting thing is the, the international collaboration tripled, but the domestic collaboration struggled to find. And so these are the issues that we would use as a reference for us here at the University of Johannesburg. Two, four, six, seven issues that we would use to look ourselves in the mirror and to look ahead. And it's on, on this basis that, that at UJ, our concern, and I'm going to close my remarks now, our concern has been about the pursuit of global excellence and stature simultaneously, simultaneously is that as that of an inclusive, a diverse, a transformed and sustainable future. I don't want to regale you with our own work here. We've, we've worked with Julian Son there at the back who's just walked in. Uh, we had important conversations here uh, internally with uh, some uh, 250 or so leaders in the university, academic leaders, leaders in our professional divisions, the senior executive, and so we've had conversations We've had our own journey, an unfinished journey, internally, facilitated by Julian, as we examine ourselves and pose these questions as well. Um, I, I just want to summarize that by saying that the university has now had three culture audits, staff audits, in order to examine where are we, where are we headed. And given that the university was a merged university, 2005, the challenge then uh, for us was to make progress from a fractious beginning to a more positive and constructive um, uh, future. 
We've had three of those. Um, in the first instance, we had a, a rating of 52%. So our index came in at 52% in 2008. So we always say, uh, if a student gets 52% at UJ, you know. It's a serious borderline case, right? You know what 52% means. I'm not talking about the metric 30% now. At university, 30% is not good enough to get through, right? But even a 52% is kind of borderline, right? So you can see our assessment then in 2008 was borderline, right? Our subsequent one in 2010 was 57%. You can see the student is struggling to get out of the 50s, from 52 to 57. And last year, we did our third survey, and uh, we're now on the precipice of 70%. We had a 69% uh, a staff uh, culture index, which signals that the efforts that are being made in the university is beginning to, to find its way in how staff experience the university. And so I, I conclude, um, there is much more that I can share with you. I, 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 I think there's one thing I should share as I conclude. Uh, one of them is an important part of the invisible is the introduction of citizenship modules in our undergrad programs. And later, when you have the opportunity to go downstairs, okay, we downstairs, upstairs, and then downstairs, uh, you will see an exhibition of student art that seeks, seeks to bring together citizenship, values, ethics, democracy, transformation, change, diversity with art. And I hope you will find some connection and meaning between what they learn in the class and what they express in their artwork. I should also say to you that 18% of our first year class come from the lowest two quintiles of public schools in South Africa. So let's not forget that dimension of diversity. Because as the middle classes, it's wonderful to sit in our air-conditioned conference rooms and boardrooms and think that South Africa is about the middle class. So yes, our first year class at UJ, about 43% are from the middle class. About 30 or so percent, 30 odd percent, 38 percent, if I have my numbers right, are from the so-called upper class in South Africa. But we set a deliberate tar target. And you may fault us on setting the target too low. But our target is at least 10 percent of children, students who come into this university annually come from the lowest two quintiles of schools. And that is an indicator of the poorest in our community. This year, 18% uh, of our first year class come from the poorest um, uh, in the most marginal in our society. And I should say that the university's enrollment grew from 2008, 41,800 to 48,500 as we speak. And that all of that growth, 6,500 students, added into our enrollment are black African, and most of them are first-generation university entrants. And so deliberate efforts that we have made to transform, or to use a term of a former boss of mine, uh, Kada Asma, to transmogrify uh, the, the University uh, of jo jo Johannesburg. And so all of this, I finished then by saying that all of this is, is rewarding. When last week, uh, UJ was ranked in the top 4% of universities worldwide. And so out of 16,500 universities, the university was rated for its global excellence and stature. But what this reminds me is that the pursuit of global excellence and of transformation and diversity are mutually reinforcing. And that then one can have even greater pride when our institutions are able to demonstrate active pursuit of inclusion, transformation, diversity, and at the same time be ranked for their global excellence and stature. And so I welcome you uh, on, 
on, on that note, and I hope that you will find your time here enjoyable and that you will find time to come back in future to the University of Johannesburg to come and experience our culture, to come and experience who we are. We can give you the numbers, but ultimately it is about who we are that matters. It's about our personality. It is about the buzz. It's about the energy, and it's about whether we talk a good talk or whether we talk and do at the same time. So I hope you'll have an enjoyable conference. Many thanks.